welcome back to another episode of Worship Tech Makeover. I'm your host, Adam, the lead tech instructor for Worship Ministry School students. I want to share with you about my most recent visit. I went to Shiloh Fellowship in Maricopa, Arizona. That is near Phoenix. And I've been working with Dustin. He is an associate pastor at this church, and he's been set in charge of overseeing the media team for his church. He hasn't had a ton of experience with this some, but uh, he's just been able to learn a lot through the Worship Ministry School courses, and he's been able to take on a lot of this, but I think felt some confidence with being able to have someone there in person. So I was able to go visit them and take a look at what they've got going on, and I wanted to share that with you guys. Visiting in person gave us a chance to kickstart his goals of having an overview of everything that was going on technology-wise and starting to simplify that and make it really volunteer-friendly. On day one, getting there and just starting to have conversations of what they wanted things to look like, what their goals were, it was just really clear that they needed some standard operating procedures, some role descriptions for the uh, technical volunteers, and that might sound really uninteresting or daunting to create something like that, but the result of that is going to be having a less stressed and a larger tech team that really feels confident in what they are called to do in serving in their roles. Because I've seen a really large need for this, I've developed a course called Developing Pro Volunteers for Worship Ministry School students, and that just outlines and gives a template for having a team hub essentially a website that is interactive that allows people to store all the information that their volunteers need to see in one place and allows you to have training and those standard operating procedures and manuals and anything that else, else that someone might need to succeed in their role in whatever they're volunteering for. So that is in the works and we've started to implement some of that with some of the students already. Pulling together those resources, creating those standard operating procedures, all of that can be done virtually, so we started focusing our time on audio and lighting. Before we dive into audio, I think I have to explain something about Shiloh Fellowship and how unique they are in that they began with an online-only presence and then grew into having an in-person gathering option. Because of this, their focus in setting up their entire system was for broadcast creating a television studio that would have video content created out of it without necessarily concerning themselves with any sort of in-person audience to view the recordings of it. With that in mind, let's dive into audio. They've got a Digico S21 for their front of house mixing console. It's kind of my first time really getting spent a lot of time on one. I really enjoyed it. I think it's great. But the way that it was set up, was for their broadcast mixing. The main mix coming off of the Digico was for broadcast, and when people started to want to gather in person and watch the recordings of these services that have these in-person gatherings, they had to have sound in the room, so someone created an aux feed, and it was definitely not the main focus. It was just sort of an afterthought. And because of that, we had to make some changes to the way the board was fundamentally configured. So I used the mixing blueprint method outlined in our mixing for worship course to rebuild the consoles scene. I took what they had and moved things around so that it uh, worked better for both in-person and online mixing. This means that all of the input channels are fed into groups. These groups are fed into both the mains and the broadcast mix. And these channels that are being routed to these groups are set to Post fader, so any changes that you make in the main mix affect the broadcast mix. So that means if Susie's leading a song, you turn her vocal up, and John is singing background vocals, and you turn his vocal down, that's going to be reflected in both mixes. Something I've run into a lot is the misunderstanding that one person can mix both front of house and broadcast at the same time when they're completely separate mixes. One person cannot do both well. One person can do both, but they can't have complete focus on both at the same time. That's just how our brains work. We can switch back and forth between them pretty quick, but we can't just focus on both of them 
and give them our full attention. So having this broadcast matrix mix allows for whoever's mixing to consider the changes that need to be made in a mix and it be reflected across both front of house and broadcast. If someone wants to have a dedicated front of house engineer and a dedicated broadcast engineer, there are other methods for that, but it requires two audio engineers at all times. So this allowed us to kind of make the best of having one engineer focused on the front of house mix and those changes be made for broadcast. Some other things that I did while I was there regarding audio is updating the firmware on the Digico S21 that unlocked some new features like having the ability to have a left center right output from the main mix, dynamic EQs, and then additional DigiTube pre's and some other things. We also replaced the multiband compressors on the channels with dynamic EQs. The reason I like this is it's a little bit more controlled in you know, you can have the Q wider or narrower. You can have it for specific frequency bands that you choose. Uh, I think it's just a better tool for shaping sound than um, a multiband compressor in certain things for certain channels. We also removed some unnecessary gear. So we've got this rack. I think there were three or four pieces of rack gear that were not being used or didn't need to be used. They weren't adding to what was going on and even if they were no one knew how to use them so just that in itself if you don't know how to use a piece of gear you shouldn't be using it outside of redoing the mixing console scene one of the biggest impact things that we did was redeploy the speakers so in the room there were four k12.2 qsc point source speakers hung uh, throughout the room, just walking into the room, looking at them, I thought this is a lot of speakers for this room, and then putting music on and walking back and forth, hearing a lot of phase because the speakers being too close, there being too many speakers, and then being too close to each other for the size of the room. Immediately I knew we have to change this, and my assumptions about having either just two speakers in a stereo setup or three speakers in a left center right setup would be the way to go. But I was able to call a few people, one of them being Michael Curtis, who said, yes, you're on the right track. I think that that's going to be the best thing for the room. And then also my friend Ben, who I ended up sending measurements and photos of the room. And that night he put it into his computer. He sent me back a map basically saying, put the speakers in this spot point them in this direction at this angle, and here is the coverage that you'll get. There was much less phase. We were able to hear clearly at a very similar volume throughout the room by moving to having three speakers instead of four. So that's what we did, and it made a great difference in the room. I'm really happy with how that turned out. We also moved the crowd microphones or the audience or congregation microphones. They were first of all in the back of the room and they were kind of pointed at the corners of the back wall and the side walls. So it wasn't really capturing the people that well. And additionally, I didn't find any kind of delay compensation that was making sure that it was aligned with the rest of the mix. So we ended up hanging them on the front truss between the speakers pointed at the congregation. So we didn't have to worry about any time delay as far as aligning that source. And also it was pointed better at the people that were engaging in the service. So we were able to turn those up in the broadcast mix and really make it feel more like you're there. With those, you can see in this photo, we had these clamps and we had this all thread that fit into a microphone clip so it's a little overkill but it worked really great and we were able to use what was there to hang those microphones in a better spot then lastly for audio after all those changes were made we had the main audio engineer for the church come on saturday and we just went through the scene console um, let her move channels around to a spot where she was more used to them or comfortable with them as far as laying the console out and then work through some scenarios to make sure, okay, this transition is gonna happen or this scenario could come up. Let's make sure that we're prepared and that the console is configured in a way that allows for those scenarios to happen. So we did end up doing things like having a fader for the drums in the house in case we needed to 
hold the drums totally out, being that it's a smaller room, in, even behind a cage, the drum volume for the room has to be a lot quieter for broadcast, so we're able to put that on the surface and just some different little things like that to make sure that we're totally ready for whatever could happen. As far as lighting goes, previously this church was running on MPC, uh, which has been bought and sold a few different times, but I think currently is uh, owned by Onyx, so it's Onyx MPC. And if you look at the software, it can be a little intimidating, and at this point, uh, anyone that walked up to this lighting console just knew that, you know, these certain faders, you turn up or down to get them to do what you want them to, but no one really understood the program as far as going in and making changes and updating things or fixing things if a, an address was lost or whatever. So to make it very volunteer friendly, we switched to light key. And so Dustin was able to just do all that as we were working on audio at the same time. So he downloaded LightKey, he got the USB to DMX converter configured, he put all of the fixtures in. I was able to, um, I probably do this on every trip, I feel like, call my friend Frank from Pro Church Lights and get some advice this time, asking how to get the DMX addresses off of Onyx. MPC so that we could readdress the new fixtures. And anytime that you take something apart, you're bound to find things that aren't set up properly. So that happened in this case, we had different things where um, lights weren't working and we weren't sure why. Because we're kind of getting a fresh start, we were able to make sure that every DMX address is set properly, that all of the cable runs were done properly. And we were able to remove like an XLR splitter that was splitting the signal not really the right way to do it with lights, but uh, we were able to get some cables cleaned up and move the lights a little bit as we were working on them. So we were totally ready for Sunday. We also programmed a few different light scenes so we could trigger them from ProPresenter. Again, making it more volunteer friendly that no one had to go to the corner where the lighting console was set up and make some adjustments. That's one of those things that was being missed sometimes because it's a lower priority and it's an inconvenient way to control the lights. So this made it so that when we clicked the first song, it went to the worship lighting scene. When we clicked the first teaching title slide, it went to the teaching lighting. And again, that's all stuff that you can learn in the Lighting for Worship course in Worship Ministry School. Dustin was able to apply that and get it rolling for Sunday, and it worked great. The main goals that Dustin had when he joined Worship Ministry School and wanted the on-site visit was to upgrade lighting, improve the online sound, and simplify the technological infrastructure. So I'm really happy that we we're able to work together and get a really good head start or even complete some of these projects on this first trip. And I'm really looking forward to continuing to work with him and his team as they continue to work on the rest of their goals. One of my main takeaways from this specific trip was just a reminder that mastering the basics is more important than having any special tricks or special equipment and just that knowledge and skills can be applied to any mixing console, any outboard piece of gear of, of any value, but using things like complicated mixing methods or going into unnecessary complex routing without the foundation of the knowledge, like the basic mixing knowledge, is kind of like a house of cards. So someone came in and they set up all this outboard gear for the broadcast mix, but some of it wasn't being used, some of it wasn't being used properly, um, no one really understood how it worked, and therefore it's not really helpful. Even the sound system set up, there were four speakers, but they were all set to the left side, so if you pan something left or right, it changes the volume in the room. If you pan it all the way right, it's gonna disappear even. So things like that, just because um, there's a Digico S21 or some outboard gear that the broadcast mix was being fed into before it went online, didn't necessarily mean that they were getting a better mix. And so <laughs> even me walking into a scenario where I can use an X32 or an S21, just having the knowledge of here's how to get gain structure, here's how to use EQ, here's how to use compression, here's how to build a mix, 
that knowledge is much more important than whatever piece of gear you have in front of you. So I hope that's an encouragement to you if you um, are looking at other people's equipment and you feel jealous or wish that you had what they had. Uh, You can get really far with just your skills and your knowledge. So what's next for South Fellowship? They have hired a media director that was there that week that I was visiting. They are someone that has had experience with that church, and they're going to be doing the day-to-day responsibilities of like managing the mixing console scenes, the lighting, the presentation, the computers, uh, all of the video, all of that. So if you're in a position where your church has a lot of technology that you depend on for services, I think this is a really important role to have and it's often overlooked. So I believe that Shiloh Fellowship is really set up for success by having this person who has attended the church and served at the church before and is now going to be in this full-time role that they can dedicate a lot of time to continuing their work of cleaning up and simplifying and organizing and helping the volunteers be prepared to succeed. This first visit, we weren't able to accomplish everything in three days of work and then being there for Sunday services. So we were able to talk a lot about, hey, what is going to happen next after I leave? One of those is having a Dante network, getting a Dante card for the S21 so that they can remove some analog cables and just have a more robust networking possibilities for their audio routing. And then tuning the sound system, like I said, it is going through or maybe I didn't mention this, it's going through a DBX processor. So the stereo input goes to that, and then it's being processed, and I didn't have time to dig into that and fix how every speaker is just the left output instead of an LCR setup like I hoped for. They've already ordered a digital snake that is going to allow them to have more physical inputs so they can add things like stereo guitars, uh, break out the tracks from the keys, do things like having more drum microphones than they have now. So helping them pick out the right drum microphones and then maybe getting a hardware controller for light key so it's not dependent on just using ProPresenter or the lighting software with the keyboard and mouse to trigger lighting changes. If you are interested in having someone from the church front team visit your church, or even assist you remotely, you can head to worshipministryschool.com slash apply and check out the options for that. I would love to visit your church or just visit you online and help you think through what you need to do for improving the technology of your ministry or even working with volunteers or providing better resources for the volunteers that you have. I hope that this video has inspired you to make a positive impact in your ministry. So I want to say keep up the great work and I'll see you next time.